Hello, everybody. Happy Easter to you. The Lord reigns. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. As we consider this Easter, this is a strange Easter for us. It's a strange Easter in church history. I don't think there is a, an Easter Sunday in the last 2,000 years when the church has not worshipped together. This is indeed a strange day. And though we are isolated and socially distanced from one another, we can still celebrate and worship our great God and King. Jesus Christ is indeed risen from the dead. And this is the truth that we need to occupy, our, occupy our minds with this Easter Sunday. Fear is, is definitely in the air. As you watch the news, as you read the different news reports that almost come out hourly, our anxiety seems to grow. Our fear increases and it, and it grips us. But we as Christians have to set the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ before us. We have no need to fear because our Savior is risen from the dead. Jesus speaks to us from the book of Revelation. He says, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys to death in Hades. And so dear Christians, take heart. Take heart in this season. If you are in Christ Jesus, you are eternally secure in life and in death because you belong to Jesus Christ the living one who is alive forevermore, who holds in his possession the keys of death and Hades. With it being Easter, I want to, in this devotion, interrogate, question Easter a bit. And we'll focus our time in on a, a, a particular question. We're going to ask, what is the significance of Easter? Or we could phrase this a different way. What does Easter mean? What does it mean? Now, when you turn to find an answer in the New Testament, we quickly find that its pages are dominated by the subject of resurrection. The apostles were burdened with this news. As you read the New Testament, especially as you pick up Paul's letters and Peter's letters, you can barely find a page in their writings that does not mention, that does not exposit, that does not apply the news of Jesus' resurrection from the dead to the Christian. So important was resurrection to Paul that he said, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And he goes on to say later in 1 Corinthians, we are of all people most to be pitied if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. The whole theological system, the whole Christian religion hangs upon the truth of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And so important was the resurrection to Paul that he included it among the, the gospel essentials that he always proclaimed in the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he was raised, important to Paul's proclamation, on the third day. And not only is Easter important as we consider theology and as we cons consider the historicity of Christianity, but it's important personally for the apostles. Paul saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ as ultimately valuable. He reveals his desires in his letter to the Philippians. He says, For his sake, for Jesus' sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. We've got a key in on this, on this sentence. Paul says, And that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul is saying, I've, I've considered all of these things in my rubbish. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so valuable. And moving past Paul to Peter, the resurrection had been so imprinted on Peter's mind that when he spoke of the church's experience of grace and God's power corporately, he did so in terms of Jesus' resurrection. As Peter begins his first letter, he, he is celebrating this. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So you go to the New Testament 
The New Testament is all about the resurrection of Jesus. But we have to go back to our interrogation of Easter. What does it mean for Jesus to have been raised from the dead? What does Easter mean? If we're forced to give our answers at this point, we may say something like this. Well, Easter is significant because it preaches the fact that there is eternal life for all of those who believe in Jesus. Or we might say something, Easter is important because it proclaims to us the defeat of death. Or we may something, say something like this, Easter is important because it preaches the truth that our bodies, our physical bodies, will someday be reunited with our souls and spirits on the great day of resurrection. Now don't get me wrong, all of these truths are great and scriptural, and they all come from the resurrection, but I think there is something all the more fundamental about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, something that we often overlook and miss. And so the title of this devotion is this, Easter, Kingship, and Matthew's Narrative Scheme. Easter, Kingship, and Matthew's Narrative Scheme. That's a mouthful, but the title gives away my answer to the question and my argument. What is Easter fundamentally about? Well, it's about kingship. And how can we know that Easter is fundamentally about kingship? Well, the way Matthew wrote his gospel. And so we can start working through this title by looking at the last phrase in the title, Matthew's narrative scheme. What in the world does that mean? Well, it doesn't take too much work to understand that when you pick up one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that it's radically different than reading an epistle. It takes different reading skills to understand a Gospel than it does to understand an epistle. When you pick up one of Paul's letters, for instance, a letter to the Galatians, right away you know why Paul is writing this letter. You know the burden that's on his heart. It's not hidden. It doesn't take too much work to get at but when we come to Matthew's gospel, it's different. Matthew doesn't give us a nice and neat thesis statement right off the bat. Rather, he communicates the burden of his message through narrative scheme, meaning the way he put together his gospel. This means as readers, we have to pay attention to how Matthew put together the gospel, what themes he highlights and reiterates, what themes he develops and grows before us. That's how we can know his burden. And so we've looked at the scheme, Matthew's narrative scheme. Now we can focus in on the, on the second part of that title, the theme of kingship. As you study Matthew's gospel and the way that he has put it together, especially as we consider the themes of Matthew's gospel, kingship emerges as the most important. The theme is developed by Matthew, we can say, in three distinct phases. We can break up Matthew's gospel into three parts. So phase one, we can call the, the presentation of the king. So right off the bat, Matthew orients our vision towards kingship. He writes in the first verse of the book, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, this is a strange way to start a book with a long list of names. Very strange, and it might be off-putting to some of us as we pick up Matthew's gospel. While it is strange for us, Matthew is doing something very important here. Matthew wants us to understand the person of Jesus that we're going to meet in his gospel. We have to understand him from the perspective of Israel's story. Jesus is the son of Abraham. That's what Matthew says. What does that mean? Well, he means that all the promises that Abraham received from God are going to be filled up in Jesus and his ministry. We also hear from Matthew in the first verse that Jesus is the son of of David. David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 was promised a son who would sit on the throne forever. And Matthew's keying us in right from the beginning. The promise made to David in 2 Samuel 7 is now coming true in the life and in the ministry of Jesus. And Matthew won't let us miss this point as we finish, as we conclude, as Matthew concludes his genealogy, he gives us these words. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called 
the Christ. And if we move through the beginning chapters of Matthew's gospel, this is the very issue that keeps coming up. The, va- the Magi come and, and visit. And why do they come visit? Well, we hear these words. They say, where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And why does Herod rage with jealousy? Why does he move to murder baby boys, little children? Because he fears a rival king has been born, the true king of the Jews. And as we move through this presentation, we go to Jesus' baptism. And what happens there? Well, this voice booms from heaven saying, this is my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. With him, I am well pleased. And what does this mean? Well, the voice is speaking words of scripture, Psalm 2, a psalm about the coming king of Israel. And so as we look at the beginning chapters of Matthew's gospel, Matthew makes his point plain. Jesus is the true king of Israel. We can't miss it. And if we miss it, we won't get the rest of the story. And so this brings us to phase two in Matthew's gospel. We have to ask, well, what does Jesus think about this matter of kingship. Does he accept this title? Does he approve of this title? Did he conceive of himself as a long-awaited king of Israel? Is what Matthew said is true? Is what the Magi said is true? Is what the Father said from heaven true? But we get clear insight in the mind of Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. And in verse 15, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? So here's Peter Uh, the spokesman for the disciples, and he pipes up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So what is Peter talking about? What is Peter asserting? Well, he's saying, I believe, Jesus, that you are the long-promised Christ, that you are the true king of Israel, the one that we have been looking for. And so Peter agrees wholeheartedly with the introduction that we've, we've heard about Jesus. He agrees with the Magi. He agrees with the genealogy. He agrees with the words of the Father from heaven. We have to ask, well, what does Jesus think about all of this? Well, Jesus does not reject the statement. Rather, he embraces it. Even more, he breaks out in worship because of the words that he hears coming from the mouth of Peter. Jesus is excited about this. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What is Jesus saying? Peter, you have spoken the truth about me. God has given this to you. And I am happy with what you said. Now, we have to focus back in on the narrative. Because here's some changes happen. While Jesus does embrace the matter of kingship, he at the same time radically redefines the nature of kingship. Jesus did not come to fill the the nationalistic desires of Israel. He did not come to grind the Gentiles into dust. Rather, Jesus announces, the son of man is about to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. Jesus says, the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus reveals in his his physician statement that he's come to heal the sick. And so we see, what is Jesus' kingship about? Well, it's about saving a people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And he's going to do this by going to the cross and encountering the wrath of God. So this finally brings us to phase three. Jesus has been presented as the true king of Israel. Jesus has affirmed this a title, but he's also made some significant modifications. And this brings us to the third phase the rejection of the king of Israel. And so as you read Matthew's gospel, rejection happens across the board, and we don't have time to trace out this rejection in all of its places. But it happens among Jesus' disciples. They reject him. As Jesus revised the matter of kingship and he spoke of his suffering and of his death and of his service, his disciples balked at him. His disciples balked at him. They were hungry for power, not for service right after Peter confesses the messiahship of Jesus and Jesus rejoices over it, Peter opens up his mouth again. He says, chapter 16, verse 22, far be it from you, Lord, 
this shall never happen to you. And what is that? That is a rejection of Jesus's kingship. And not only does rejection come from Jesus' disciples, but most importantly in the narrative, rejection comes from the religious and political leaders of Israel. So we move into the passion sequence now, and Jesus is brought before the high priest of Israel, Caiaphas. And what does Caiaphas ask Jesus? Well, he says, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus has moved in the passion sequence from this trial with the Jewish high priest to the Romans. And so Jesus encounters Pilate, the Roman prefect, the the Roman governor of Judea, and he asks Jesus, even more plainly, even more clearly, are you the king of the Jews? And as we move throughout the the passion narrative, Matthew, Matthew carefully keeps the theme of kingship before us. He won't let us forget about it, but he continues to develop it before our eyes. In the passion narrative, Jesus is mocked on account of his kingship. So after his trial with Caiaphas, the Jews spit upon Jesus, they slap him and they taunt him. We hear these words, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? And after Jesus' trial with Pilate, Pilate's soldiers take Jesus and they make a mockery of him. You're the supposed king. And they treat him as such. In chapter 27, Matthew records this, this brutal scene. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And Matthew closes the passion sequence by bringing us near to the cross. And what do we find when we draw near to the cross in the Gospel of Matthew? Well, we find the matter of kingship plainly and clearly. Chapter 27, verse 37. Over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus the king of the Jews. And there Jesus, as he is suspended, he is mocked by the crowds and by the religious leaders again. Chapter 27, verse 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. So there we have it. We have the three phases. Jesus is presented to us as the king of Israel. Jesus himself in phase two takes this title to himself and he makes some significant modifications. And in the third phase, Jesus is put on trial for the matter of kingship. So we have to pause now and we have to try to put this all together. We have to ask, well, what is the result of all of this? Jesus dies. He's placed in a grave. And here, if we're taking the narrative seriously, we're left scratching our heads. We ask, well, did Jesus get it wrong? Was he wrong in accepting the Peter's confession? We have to ask, well, well, did the voice from heaven get it wrong? Did the God of Israel get it wrong? We have to ask, well, did Matthew get it wrong? Was Jesus deluded? We have to ask, were Israel's leaders right in condemning and killing Jesus? So we've looked at the two pieces of our title. We've looked at Matthew's narrative scheme. We've looked at the theme of kingship, and now we can focus in on the matter of Easter. So Matthew chapter 28 tells us that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went on the first day of the week to Jesus's tomb. And surely this was a sad trip for these two women. They both received the ministry of Jesus. They both experienced the the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Truly they were mourning in their hearts. But this was a strange trip for these two women. They encounter an earthquake, an angel, and ultimately an empty tomb. And what does this all mean? The angel angel speaks to these two women. He says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come see the place where he is lay, where he laid. And this is exactly where we enter into the glory and the wonder and the mystery of the Easter story. And this is where we have to connect Easter to the story of kingship. 
While Easter shouts to us that there is life after death, while Easter shouts to us the, the redemption of the body, that God is going to raise us up from the dust once again, it shouts something all the more fundamental. It shouts news about Jesus, and the news is this. Jesus is the vindicated king. He is the risen king. He is the true king over all. We have to consider this. Though sinful men pass judgment on the Lord Jesus, though his own people rejected him, though he was handed over to sinful Gentiles, though he was brutally killed and hung upon a cross, Easter declares that they were all wrong in their estimation of him. Easter preaches the glorious fact that Jesus is the true king and everyone else was wrong, that he is truly the son of God. And so we have to go back to the narrative here. We have to go back to the narrative of Matthew's gospel. So after the resurrection, Jesus appears to the 11 disciples. And how is Jesus presented in this scene? Well, he's presented as the true king, not just the geopolitical king of the nation of Israel, but over all created reality. Matthew began his gospel with the, the theme of kingship, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And how does Matthew end his gospel? Well, he ends it with the theme of kingship. The last words we hear from Jesus' mouth come in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And these words are the words of a king. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How does Matthew end his gospel? By declaring the kingship of Jesus over all things in heaven and on earth. So brothers and sisters, there's the story of Easter. There's the significance of Easter. Jesus is the true king. He's been presented as king. He lived as king. He was tried as king. And he was vindicated as the true king. So the question is now, this Easter Sunday, how do we apply, how do we apply the truth of Easter? How do we apply this significant insight that we get from the Gospel of Matthew? What does it mean for us today? I want to draw out two applications from Matthew chapter 28. And the first application is this, Easter calls us to worship. Easter calls us to worship. And this point of application is found in the story of the two Marys as they encounter Jesus and the resurrection. So these two ladies go to Jesus' tomb early Sunday morning, and we, we know how the story goes. There's this earthquake, there's the angel, there's the empty tomb with no Jesus in it. Then the angel tells the woman that they must go, they must tell the disciples what has happened. So the women run off to tell the great and glorious news of what has happened to their great king. But they don't get very far. Because what happens next? They're stopped in their tracks by the risen king himself. Verse 9 tells us, and Behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. We have to key on these words that follow. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. What do these two ladies do when they hear and when they see the risen Lord Jesus Christ? Well, they take hold of his feet. They come up to him, grab his feet, and they worship him. And so what must we do this morning after hearing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Well, we must become like these two ladies. We must bow at the feet of Jesus and worship him as the true and vindicated the king. These two ladies teach us that the resurrection of Jesus is not some dry theological fact that we pull out and read in textbooks. It is not just a date on the calendar that comes once a year and is gone. There's something more going on here. There's something more fundamental about this message of kingship. And what these two ladies teach us is that Easter is a glorious call to worship. And that's what the whole narrative is about. The great earthquake is a call to worship. The stone rolled away is a call to worship. The empty tomb is a call to worship. The announcement of the angel is a call to worship. The fear and the dread of the Roman soldiers is a call to worship. The appearance of Jesus is a call to worship. All of this is a call to worship. That is the great aim of Easter, that we might worship the true and risen King. This is what you find in the rest of the New Testament. As the Apostle Paul thinks upon the resurrection and vindication of Jesus, he says this in the book of Philippians. 
Therefore God has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's what Easter is all about, that we might bend our knees to Jesus and worship him as the true king. So dear friends, brothers and sisters, may this Easter Sunday be a Sunday of worship. May you be like those two women and take hold of Jesus' feet and worship him. He is mighty in grace. He is mighty in power. This is our king. We have to consider a second point of application as well. The Easter story doesn't end with worship. Rather, this story ends with a call to action. We must notice that the Easter story has an imperative embedded in it. Jesus requires something of his people. So what does the risen Christ say to us? Well, look at verses 18 and 20, the last words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. He says, we already considered the first words. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, Or as the older translations say, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. What is Jesus saying? Well, he's saying, I've been, I've, I've risen from the dead. I've been installed as a rightful king over all creation. And now as my people, you must go and do something. And what is it that we must do? It's very simple. We tell people of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. We tell people that he is the true king over all created reality. And this is our role as Christ's people. We teach people the resurrection news, that Jesus is the king over them and that they must worship him. They must bend their knee to him. And what a joyous occupation we have as Christians. We worship the king and in our worship, we go out and proclaim the news of his kingship. And as you think about it, we're like the newsboy. We go around, and what we're doing is we're telling the news. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he is the true king. You must repent and believe in him and worship him as well. He is worthy of your worship. So brothers and sisters, on this Easter Sunday, take heart in the good news of the resurrection. Jesus is the true king. Even more, worship this king today. Worship him with your families. And as you worship him, Call others to join the worship of this king as well. Make a phone call, send a text, send an email. Proclaim the news today. Jesus has been raised. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we do worship you with glad and thankful hearts. What glorious news you've placed in our hands. Jesus Christ is the true king. Father, we ask today, give us soft and moldable hearts. Give us hearts that can perceive the great truth of Jesus' resurrection. May we be like the two Marys who grab hold of Jesus' feet and worship him. Give us a heart like that. And Father, we ask for your help. We ask for your grace and mercy. Be our aid as we go and proclaim the great news. Give us joy in this. Give us obedience in this. And may many, especially in this strange time of coronavirus, bow their knee to King Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' great and glorious name.